Science estimates that life on Earth began around 6,000 million years ago with the first living beings swimming in their primeval sea. Since then, evolution has created an extraordinary variety of plant and animal species, an amazing spectrum of very different forms and designs which nonetheless all obey certain basic rules. All the animals and plants we can see today are victors in the struggle for survival, a struggle in which many others have been left by the wayside. There is not a single one, however insignificant it may seem, that is not a master at something. The game of life has absolute, unbending rules, the laws that govern natural selection. Every change introduced by the genes is carefully examined to determine whether this particular variation makes the species more or less competitive. In time, the evolutionary lines that don't work will die out, while those that introduce improvements to the original model pass on these advantages to their descendants and so survive. As simple and as complicated as that. However, everything comes at a price. This anteater is the best at what he does, but he would be incapable of eating anything else. He now depends completely on ants and termites. The snakes adapted by losing their legs, but in exchange they gained a series of advantages that have made them a highly successful group. Once a given path is chosen, there is no going back, and often a simple change in the surroundings can leave entire lineages of animals stuck in a dead end. The cheetah is the fastest, but it had to reduce the size of its claws and now it would be unable to kill a buffalo. Curiously, some small snakes could because they invented powerful venoms. In this arms race, only one branch chose to invest all its energies in a single organ, the creative brain. Over time, with its capacity to invent, it learned to imitate the weapons of all the other animals and came to rule over the earth. Now this same mental capacity that brought success runs the risk of turning into its worst nightmare. Only one animal on the entire earth is capable of conquering paradise, making it his home, and then turning it into hell. The game is by no means over. Sixty million years ago, at the start of the tertiary era, the world climate was uniformly warm with abundant rain. In those conditions, everything was occupied by rainforests and the most highly evolved plants called anthophytes or seed-bearing plants obtained energy from the sun in the presence of plentiful water. The anthophytes developed an extremely ingenious system of reproduction. They invented flowers of appealing colors full of sweet nectar to attract the small animals whose bodies would then transport the pollen from one plant to another. The system was an evolutionary success, but some 60 million years later the climate began to change. The continents moved, and in many places around the world, temperatures dropped. There was less rainfall and the forest shrank, leaving large open spaces. This was the opportunity for another humbler and more backward line of plants, the graminiae, commonly known as pasture or grass. The simple grasses did not have large flowers or heart-shaped leaves, but neither were they dependent on the pollinating animals in order to reproduce. They launched their pollen into the wind and with it colonized the entire planet. Like David against Goliath, the unremarkable grasses won out against the proud, ostentatious anthophytes. 
In addition, land covered in grass can feed 90% more herbivorous animals than the same surface area occupied by forest. Not only are they not harmed by being eaten, it in fact makes them grow even more. Their reserves are well guarded beneath the ground and will repeatedly grow again even from the part above the surface is devoured a hundred times. In this way, the savannas, prairies and steppes occupied enormous spaces on all the continents feeding legions of herbivorous animals. Various lineages of mammals eagerly took up the challenge to make the most of the abundant grass. For a mammal, vegetable matter is difficult to digest and the majority of what is consumed simply goes to waste. This means they are forced to eat large quantities throughout the day. But one of the branches, that of the bovines, deer and antelopes, managed to house in their stomach certain bacteria that help them to ferment the grass and so make more efficient use of this food. They are what are known as the ruminants. In the parallel world of Australia, the marsupial version of the grass eater is the kangaroo. Kangaroos demonstrate that evolution seeks similar solutions to the same problems. They are an example of adaptive convergence. They have bacteria in their stomachs and chew the cud like the ruminants, but are at the opposite end of the genealogical tree from the mammals. Their system of moving by jumping saves energy in short stretches, but it is not suitable for the long migrations the ruminants of the rest of the world have to undertake. That is why all others use four legs. All except one, man. Herbivores need to be constantly on the move in order to eat, and at least twice a year they migrate, longer or shorter distances in search of places with more grass. Moreover, the grasses of tropical regions are less nutritious than those of the northern hemisphere. Therefore, all the herbivores of the world, ruminants or not, have in common certain physical characteristics which enable them to travel great distances using the minimum energy in order to find fresh pasture wherever it is. This, therefore, is the origin of all these swift animals of the savanna, not the pressure of predators as was at first thought. This grass revolution was also vital in the development of human beings. That moment between two and four million years ago came just when the human genealogical line had reached a crucial point, the birth of the Homo genus from the Australopithecus here in Eastern Africa. Whatever their name, the proto-humans of the time were rather small, stood erect and had very good eyesight. They weren't capable of hunting down the large running herbivores, nor could they compete against the formidable predators. How therefore were they to obtain their share of meat? in a similar way to that now used by the black-backed jackals. They are also too small to hunt large prey or compete against a lion, and they do not have wings to spot dead bodies from the air like the vultures. And yet, they are almost always the first on the scene. They have three characteristics also shared by the humans of that time. Good eyesight, legs capable of running long distances, and a certain inventiveness. The secret lies in the vultures, out on the savannah, when a large animal dies of hunger, thirst, exhaustion, or previously inflicted wounds, it is normally first discovered by the vultures. But the vultures cannot eat if another scavenger does not open up the tough body of the animal. While they wait, they form large circles in the sky, circles that are visible from a great distance. Those African Homo erectus, like these bushmen today, were capable of spotting the clouds of vultures in rapidly traveling considerable distances without ever losing sight of the birds of prey, thanks to their erect posture. If they got there in time, they could open up the body thanks to the use of sharp shards of stone and tear off great hunks of meat to take with them before the lions and hyenas arrived. They had to be fast, skillful, and intelligent. 
They needed good eyesight to spot the vultures, the ability to interpret them, an erect posture so as not to lose sight of them out on the grasslands while using the minimum energy, and primitive tools to cut through the hide. No other animal combined all these characteristics. In this way, early humans were able to increase the amount of meat in their diet and, as a consequence, their brain development. The brain is a demanding organ in terms of energy. It uses up around 20% of the total of the body's total energy consumption. But there was a problem. The majority of the time, this work had to be carried out under a burning sun. Running in the heat raises the body temperature to dangerous limits. Evolution had to invent a special cooling system for human beings. That is why we lost virtually all the hair on our bodies and developed sweat glands. So, like so many other species, we are children of the savanna, the result of the grass revolution. Throughout the planet, even the jungles that remained, other meat-eaters preferred to improve their claws and fangs, among other things. The felines have without a doubt been one of the most successful groups in the arms race of the game of life. But hunting continues to be difficult, because the intended prey simply refuses to collaborate. Evolution makes sure that both hunter and hunted constantly change and improve. Every unsuccessful attempt to hunt is an incredible drain on the hunter's energy. If it uses up all its energy, it'll die of hunger, and that is something that happens to many predators every day. The places where the land and the sea come together are especially rich in life because there the nutrients of both worlds are to be found. Seals and sea lions are two of the mammalian branches that chose to return to the sea. The other one is that of the whales, including the most intelligent assassins of the seas, the orcas. This breeding colony of sea elephants in southern Argentina is being carefully observed by several families of orcas. They know that sooner or later someone will make a mistake. An adult sea elephant like this one is capable of inflicting serious wounds on an orca. But the orcas are well organized. They don't want to end the hunt too quickly because they are teaching the young members of the herd how to kill. While the adults block the escape route back to the beach, the young orcas again and again bite at its flanks, releasing spurts of blood. The young orcas must take advantage of these occasions to learn the techniques of hunting in a group, one of the most deadly strategies adopted by certain predators on our planet, and which makes them virtually invincible. After the line of the primates to which we belong, the cetaceans are the most intelligent animals on the planet. This cooperative form of hunting requires coordination among the different elements and complex communication through sounds. The rules of the game of life dictate that this sea elephant should not have strayed so far from the coast. 
In all likelihood, he did so spurred on by his sexual desires, and it'll cost him dear. That is how natural selection works. This reckless male will not engender reckless cubs, and so that particular characteristic will be gradually wiped out among the sea elephant population. But on the other hand, he is collaborating in teaching the young orcas to kill better, which goes against his own species. From this bloody encounter, each species draws its conclusions. It's a game, after all, a constant test of strength. But the question of animal intelligence is always controversial. Is this octopus's ability to change color of form of intelligence? Imitating the background is a technique that some species have mastered to perfection. This is a fish but its imitation of a piece of drifting seaweed is absolutely superb. His disguise helps him catch small prey while avoiding becoming someone else's breakfast. If it didn't move, you would never know this Madagascan gecko was there. But this reversible Ecuadorian frog plays a double game, camouflage on top and attention-seeking at the bottom. Hunters also know the trick. This lancehead snake looks just like another branch, but it bites. The gecko will never know what it was that grabbed it by the neck. Twice. The genetic changes to improve the species are not only physical. There are also a series of codes that remain engraved in the minds of many animals and are not the result of that individual's previous experience. One example of this are the bright colors that warn that a given animal is poisonous or doesn't taste good. All species in that environment would seem to understand them. In some way they are programmed responses, even if they have never seen them before. This frog is undoubtedly trying to say something with these bright colors. When a hunter detects movement, he heads towards it as he almost always does, stealthily, but implacably. But when he sees it close up, he suddenly loses his appetite and makes a quick exit. The interspecies color code has, fortunately for this frog, worked. As hunting is so complicated, some species of animals have specialized in robbery. Eggs are nutritious rations of pure energy, wrapped, ready to take away. Here in the Valdez Peninsula, the Magellan penguins have one of their breeding colonies. The females lay two eggs in their nests dug in the ground, and both parents take turns to defend them, while the other one goes into the sea to feed. But sometimes they don't quite coordinate their movements and the nest is left untended. Then the egg thieves spring into action.
The screwers or parasitic jagers are true pirates. They constantly patrol the penguin colony, just waiting for one to make the fatal mistake. They are large, intelligent birds that could easily hunt or fish for themselves, but they have specialized in pillage. This strategy confirms the prevalence of the system of minimum effort in the natural world. For a skua, it makes more sense, from an energy conservation point of view, to steal eggs rather than flying long distances to fish. If they steal too many, they could wipe out the penguin colony. But it is more than likely that the skuas are the reason why the penguins lay two eggs instead of one. Both sides continue to hone their respective strategies. Eggs are packed with proteins and other nutrients, and the largest ones in the world, those of the ostrich, were around when those first hominids were evolving in Africa. Man also collected eggs, even before he reached the savannah. Eating eggs would seem to be a kind of intermediate stage between a vegetarian and a future hunter. It's just a short step from stealing an egg to killing the parent watching over it. But some animal thieves have permission from the owners to take what they find. This is one of them. This bird is called an oxpecker or tick bird and is a vital part of the personal hygiene of these buffaloes. In reality, the birds remove the ticks and other pesky parasites from their large friends, who in exchange provide them with protection and a good moving lookout point. This kind of association began when the birds took advantage of the insects the ruminants scared up as they walked. Then they began to eat the ones they spotted on their skin. But now some of these birds are acquiring a taste for the blood they eat along with the ticks, and they're starting to take it directly from any wounds. So we could be witnessing a friendship, which is about to end. On the other side of the world, on the plains of Venezuela, two other very different species have signed a similar contract. The capybaras await their turn for a session of parasite removal with this yellow-headed caracara, a relative of the eagles and falcons, which has also switched over to an easier source of food. These changes in the habits of certain animals may begin as anecdotic episodes and end up giving rise to a new species which little by little adapts to its new diet. Sometimes it is more difficult to imagine how certain associations of this type could have started. For example, this one. What led that first prawn to venture inside the mouth of a prawn-eating moray? The red and white colors of the arthropod identified it as a member of the maintenance team, something like the Red Cross of personal hygiene, and therefore it is forbidden to eat it. And the moray respects the pact in exchange for having the parasites removed from inside its mouth, a place where normally nothing that goes in ever comes out. While this and other survival strategies were being developed, human beings completed their evolution and, thanks to their creative intelligence, were capable of imitating all the weapons of the other animals, and so became the most efficient predator ever known. But when we began to kill and destroy more than was absolutely necessary, going against our own interests as a species, we broke the rules of the game. <laughs>